afternoon, everybody. It's good to see you. Let's all stand. Let's worship our Heavenly Father. Let's give him all the glory, the honor, and praise. He's worthy of it all. He's so good. Let's sing us out. Well, I was lost. And he found me. And I was sick. He healed me. And I was dead. Raise me up again. Well, I was bound, He freed me. Now I stand in His victory. I was desperate, and He saved me from my sin. Isn't He good? Yeah. Isn't He good? Isn't He great? Isn't he faithful? Look at my life and look what he's done. Isn't he able? Isn't he good? Isn't he great? Isn't he worthy? Oh, he's worthy. He's worthy. Isn't he? Mighty God, Jehovah. Messiah, all the glory to our resurrected King. Yeah. Isn't he good? Isn't he great? Isn't he faithful? Look at my life and look what he's done. Isn't he able? Isn't he good? Isn't he great? Isn't he worthy? Yes, he is. Our God is worthy. Isn't he worthy? Isn't he? Isn't he worthy? Isn't he worthy? Isn't he? Isn't he worthy? Yes, he is. Our God is worthy. Isn't he worthy? Isn't he? Isn't he worthy? Hey, good morning, Life Point. Welcome to church. Morning, young adults. Hey, I'm Scott Burrow, one of the volunteers with our young adults. Just want to greet you this morning. Say we're glad that you are here. Thanks for joining us for church. Hey, and young adults, two weeks ago, we, we jumped into to 2 Peter. And this letter from Peter, Peter tells us in chapter 1, he reminds the church to remember what we already know. Remember the Old Testament and the prophecy and the, and the commitment of God from then to now. Remember what Peter lived firsthand, that New Testament, Jesus walking the miracles and what he did for us. And he tells that story as this is what I lived and saw. And then we today get to remember those things and know that God is good, God is great and faithful, just like we sang, and he has done this for us in our life. We celebrate that together as a church family. Hey, take a moment, greet one another, and then we're gonna turn back around and keep worshiping.
Well, church, do you guys believe that God is good? Amen. Do you believe that God is faithful? Amen. Do you believe that he is worthy of our praise? Do you believe that there is nobody like our God? There is no one, nothing like our God. Do you believe that, church? Amen. We're going to sing a new song today about how God saved us. And he's the only one that can. He is worthy of our praise. He can do more than we could ever comprehend or imagine. It's a pretty easy song to catch on to, but it's a new song. So why don't you take some time to just soak in the words, let the words pour over you and enter into that place of worship. True joy of all that Christ has done in our lives. We have been saved by the amazing grace of God. Only the love, the grace, and mercy of our Heavenly Father. No one is like Him. And He is worthy of our praise. I have been saved by the grace of God. Amen. I have been raised to a future without it. I set my eyes on a true and loyal friend. song but let's lift that up one voice declaring that we trust in God to him be the glory now to him be the glory he's able to 
struggle to do more than we could ask or imagine. Amen, amen. Now to him be the glory. Let his people shout his victory through all generations. Amen, amen. The dark tried to hide you. And I tried to keep you inside of the grave. The enemy fought you, he tried, but he lost. Oh, you cannot be stopped. God for freedom, you tore down the world. The weight of our burdens, you carry it all. Our fears and our failures hang dead on the cross. Church, move her mountains, move her up mountains, break her up chains. Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. We stand on your Victory, and we shout out your praise. Miracle maker, your mighty to save. Awesome in power, relentless in love. stop our God. There is nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. Sing, sing that out. Declare that there's nothing. There is nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. You cannot be stopped. There is nothing that can stop our God. You cannot be stopped. There is nothing that can stop our God. Fighting for us. There is nothing that can stop our God. Over the grave, 
Church, there is nothing that can stop our God. No fear, no shame, no guilt, no grave can stop him. Can we get an amen because Jesus is alive. So good to worship this morning. You guys can have a seat. Well, my name is Nick Tucker. I'm one of the student, or I'm one of the pastors around here, uh, the student ministries pastor, um, to be precise. But so excited you guys have decided to join us uh, today and, and worship with us. Um, so happy you guys are here. I've got a bunch of announcements to tell you guys. Um, so you're in the know of all the things coming up, um, can know what to expect and anticipate some things. So first things first, if you're new around here, whether you're here in person, online, wherever you're at, we would love to connect with you. You can do so a number of different ways. You can grab the card in the seat back pocket in front of you, uh, fill that out. You can scan the QR code on the screen or you can text connecting to 94000. However you fill out uh, the connection card, we'd still love to connect with you in person. Uh, and so be sure to take that connection card that you fill out in person, um, stop out at the connection hub in the lobby. We've got a free gift just for saying thanks for joining us uh, today. At that same number by texting connecting to 94000, uh, or scanning the QR code, you'll also find our digital bulletin. The reality is there's so much going on here at LifePoint. We don't entirely have enough time to talk about all of it, but you'll find a bunch of things there of all different things coming up. A couple things to highlight is this summer, we've got summer camps and summer vibe for both our students and our kids programs, which is super exciting. I'm fired up about it. And here's the encouragement about this. Uh, I read a statistic about summer camps and faith decisions. 40% of all faith decisions, there's a study in 2019, 40% of all faith decisions are made before the age of 12. Another 30% is made between the ages of 12 and 21. And so 70% of all faith decisions are made in that age range. And so it's so important for students and kids to get plugged into camp. And so if you're not signed up for either of those uh, camps, uh, whether it's summer camp with houseboats uh, for the students or summer vibe for kids, be sure to get your kids signed up. If you know about kids, get them signed up. Spots are limited. Um, and we want every student and every kid to come and know about Jesus. And so that's just a quick nugget. A couple other things to mention uh, is we have an LP Cares Facebook group. Uh, we're called to care for one another and bear one another's burdens um, within the church body. And one of the ways that we can do that is by just seeing what needs people have. Uh, sometimes we don't even know that. And so if you're on Facebook, we encourage you to go to LifePoint Church uh, on Facebook, like it, and then join our, our LP Cares page. There you'll see needs of other people uh, in the church, but also be able to put any needs that you might have and, and help one another to uh, care for one another and all that good stuff. You can find more information f about that at lifepoint.org slash LP Cares. And then the last thing that I want to mention is uh, on May 19th in a couple weekends, we have a parent workshop coming up. And this is something I'm super excited about because because at this particular one, we're really going to be going into some curriculum about uh, sex, sex education that has been handed out in the public schools. And now for those of you who might not have kids that are in public school, this is still prevalent for you because the internet exists. And so be sure to come check it out. Uh, get equipped as parents to navigate through the hard conversations with your, with your kids. Um, lead them in the faith well, all that good stuff. You can sign up, get more information at lifepoint.org slash parent workshop. And then the last thing, of course, is giving. If you consider LifePoint your home church, uh, we want to give you an opportunity to continue your worship through giving. We read in scripture that God loves a cheerful giver. And so we want to thank you for your financial generosity um, for those of you who have been giving. Um, but this is a great way where we can give back our first fruits and thank God for all that he's given us and just continue to partner um, with the local church to advance the kingdom. And so I'm going to pray over the, over the offering over the giving. Um, our, one of our elders, Mark Briggs,
Briggs is gonna come out and close out our series, Love of My Life. Um, But would you join me in praying over the offering? Mark's gonna make his way up and we'll continue with our morning. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the ways that you've blessed us, for the ways that you have shown up. God, there is nothing that can stop you. And for that, we give you praise. We give you glory. And so Father, speak this morning through Mark. Allow for uh, the words that he's prepared to flow off his tongue uh, smoothly um, and be exactly what you have for us, what your spirit has for us and open our hearts to receive that this morning. Jesus, I pray over the offering, pray over all the things. Um, You are good and we are grateful. It's in your mighty, holy, awesome, powerful name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Morning. Morning. Uh, welcome to week five of our series, Love of My Life. As Nick said, we're closing out a series uh, where we uh, have been looking at uh, some of the Apostle's words, Apostle Paul's words uh, to the Christians in the city of Ephesus. And what Paul has done uh, in this passage, what we've talked about during this series, is he's given us principles that can hopefully help us develop strong, thriving, and healthy relationships. And today we look at a topic that affects us all. Uh, unless you're dead, really. The message today will be helpful to anyone in a relationship uh, with another person, married, dating, friendships. And as a reminder, we've been looking through what Paul says in Ephesians 5 specifically, uh, when he's specifically talking about marriage. And so what we're talking about today is conflict. Uh, you may go, none. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't even seen that in my marriage at all. But uh, it happens in all relationships. And don't worry, if you're not married, we, it, this is relevant for everyone here. But let me, first of all, off, uh, dispel a myth uh, when it comes to marriage. If you're not married or newly married and you just think, man, we're just getting along so well and things are so smooth, it's rainbows and unicorns and, and all that kind of stuff. But let me dispel a myth right from the beginning. Uh, good couples are not couples who never fight. That's a myth. Good couples are couples who've learned to fight fairly, uh, to fight in a Christian way. And if you say you never fight, uh, you will. Uh, And honestly, you need to. If you never do at all, there's probably stuff you need to address. But you just can't get close to another person in this fallen world uh, without there being conflict. And you're never closer than when you're in a marriage, same house, uh, repeated conversations, closeness. But the problems that usually split up marriages, it's not usually some special class of problems. It can be, but they're usually generic problems uh, that are present in every marriage. So what happens is that, you know, one or the other partners, they don't know how to handle conflict. They don't know how to keep minor issues from becoming major ones. And in many cases, there's no problem in the marriage per se, but the problem's in them. And again, let me say, this, there's, there's streams in here that are going to be very consistent. It could be a child, could be, you know, dating relationship, it could be uh, parents and all of that. But we're going to look at two passages in Ephesians that talk about conflict. And the first one relates to conflict in marriage. And the second one relates to conflict uh, in the church. And so what we're going to do is look at these passages because both of them, uh, in either case, the source of the conflicts and the solutions for the conflicts are the same. You know, Scripture is consistent, and we see that in these passages. So we're just going to dive in, starting with Ephesians chapter 5, a passage we've already read, but I'll read it from a little different perspective. Uh, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Paul shows us right here what God wants in our marriage and the means of achieving that goal. The aim is sanctification to be made holy. And the pattern for achieving that for both of you or in any relationship, it's the cross. And for those of you, you're like new to Christianity, when I say the cross, what we're talking about is the truth that Jesus came down as 100% God, 100% man, died on a Roman cross, which you may be aware of, but what he did in that was took away uh, the blame for all our sin. 
And so if you enter into a relationship with Christ, that is done. You're forgiven. You're given grace through that. And so the pattern for achieving uh, peace is for both of us is the cross because the cross demonstrates it's about our conflict with God. We had irreconcilable differences with him. And God took it on himself to solve these irreconcilable differences. Like Paul wrote in there, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It's total sacrifice that God did on the cross for us. That's how we must, must learn to respond in our marriages. And you want to understand why there's conflict in relationship, what God's purpose is in it, and what you should do during it. You have to understand this principle that God's primary goal in marriage is not just making you happy or fulfilled. His primary goal is to make you holy, to be more like him, to be on that path towards Christ's likeness. His means of doing that is by teaching you to wash the feet of those you know, to carry the cross for another person who certainly falls short. I don't think there's any question. There's a lot of people here, you're great people, but you fall short, right? We all do. We all do. And so in Ephesians 4, Paul goes into more detail. He unpacks where the conflict comes from, what to do about it, and you're going to see the same principle at work. And so uh, the way this day is going to go is we're going to have three commands where Paul gives you for how to fight. So today, later today, someone will say, what did they talk about at church? I learned how to fight. It was wonderful. Thank Jesus. Okay. Uh, gives you commands for how to fight. And then we're going to have some real practical steps so how we can fight well. And we're going to be primarily in Ephesians chapter 4. Um, and what we're going to do in this passage is we're going to understand more about ourselves so that we can fight in a Christian way. We can avoid the kind of conflict that, that, that uh, delivers scars to our lives. And so we pick it up in verse 25 of Ephesians 4. Great passage. Uh, Paul says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Remember, when we talked marriage, they talked about the husband and wife become one, one body. We talked about the church as one body. So, I mean, there, there's parallels there as well. Verse 26, he writes, in your anger, do not sin. And the New American Standard, a little more literal, it actually says, be angry and do not sin. So it's telling you to be angry and, and do not sin. We'll get into that in a minute. We're going to get into a lot of this. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. And this other verse, if you have a Bible, underline it. This is at the core, we'll get into it. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. You may go, that doesn't sound like me, but we'll get into it. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, as in Christ, God forgave you. There is a whole lot in here to unpack. And frankly, when it comes to conflict, now if you sinners would just listen to this, we could be done with this series, like today. Oh, we are done, but we could just pray right now if you want. No, um, Again, there's so much in here that God's telling you and I, but we're going to start with the first command, and we're going to spend the majority of our time, don't be worried about each one getting equal time or else you'll be really worried in a little bit, but command one for how to fight was be angry and do not sin. Again, notice Paul didn't say you're supposed to never get angry, and in fact, he's almost kind of commanding you, it's okay to be angry, but he says when you do it, don't sin. In James chapter 1, uh, 19, James says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. And so the answer is not no anger. It's not blowing up in anger. It's slow anger. And I want to reflect on this topic a minute because it's at the core of so much conflict. We should be angry sometimes. John Christensen, an early Christian preacher, said, and this is so profound, he who is angry without cause sins. But he who is not angry when there is cause sins. If you, don't have, a, if you have a God who never gets angry, you don't have a God of love. 
If you never get angry about anything, you don't love anything. Because if you love and you see something or someone be hurt, be affected, you get angry. Angry in its purest form, it's love and motion towards a threat to that which you love or to someone whom you love. So in this passage, it says, in your anger, do not sin. So our question is, but when does it take a turn for the worse? And that's where we get to verse 31. Um, If you'll remember, uh, he defines it there. He says, to be angry and not sin is to be angry without bitterness, without rage, without brawling, without slander, without malice. Those things are when an irritation or Uh, when anger has taken on this deep, burning quality, when it becomes resentment, you know, when it becomes bitterness, uh, when it can even become hatred, if we're honest. And it's one thing to say, hey, cut those out. Don't do those anymore. Oh, it's easier said than done, right? If you don't get down the root of where these things are, it doesn't do anything. It's like in your your yard or in your garden. I mean, you can Cut off the top of a weed, it's just going to be right back. But we need to get to the root of it. We need to deal with it. And so we see where the core of this comes from in James chapter 4. We pick it up in verse 1. And he asks the question, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And what he's basically saying is, where does conflict come from? Like, where does it come from? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? If you're in a relationship, a close family relationship, a marriage, so much if I say, where does conflict come from? I don't see the thumb, I see the finger, right? I mean, we're going, the conflict comes from them, right? They've wronged me. James says, don't they come from the desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. The bottom line is the reason that we have conflict, if I'm to say it for me, I'm not getting what I want. I'm not getting what I want. The anger is directed at you, spouse, because you're keeping me from what I want or you're not giving me what I deserve. You see, most of unhappiness and strife and conflict And my life, I think often is because of what someone else in that relationship does to me. But James says, think deeper. It's the passions at war deep within you. It's the passions at war within you. And the problem, James says, is how controlling your desires are on you. Your desires for those things have become so important, You can despise anyone who keeps them from you and who has the opportunity to offend you the most but those you're closest to. Anything you have to have to have happiness or peace is an idol. Anything that you have to have to have happiness or peace. And we can hate anything or anyone that keeps us from it. Uh, Tim Keller said it so well. He said, idols are when something, even a really good thing, become the ultimate thing when those become our goal, when those become our goal. And how can you have anger that's disproportionate to the cause of the anger? Have you experienced that? I know I have. You know, someone puts a, this isn't me, but it's a similar thing, like someone puts a cup on a wood table without a coaster, and I mean, have any of you just, what are you doing? Because why do you say that? It's happened a million times, but it's disproportionate. Why do we do that? That's where real conflict, unhealthy conflict happens. It's because, as St. Augustine said, we are, I love this. We are disordered. Get t-shirts, guys. We can all be disordered together, right? But if it's true that anger can be a form of love, disordered love leads to disordered anger. And loving anger is I I, I want to do a surgical strike on the evil that is maybe affecting someone I know. My son may have an attitude, my daughter may respond a certain way, I should want to do a surgical surgical strike on the evil part of it, but what do we end up doing? We end up taking it out on the person. Disordered anger is when you go after them. That is at the core of our conflict. Um, I'll be a little transparent here, Uh, don't judge me, I'll try, but one of my many idols is control. It's control. There's, I know, I know there's some of you out there too, you you like to, you're ordered, you like to uh, control your time. Like if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do this at this time and this at this time. And, you know, I have a structure to how I do it. I have it planned. And then 
Let's say someone, no one specifically, uh, hypothetically says, hey, I'll be home at 4 o'clock. The way I work is I'm thinking, okay, 4 o'clock. So at 3.45, there's something I'm needing from them. It's not just them being home, but maybe we're needing to change cars. Maybe there's something that we need to help each other with. Maybe it has to do with, with the kids. But if this person comes, you know, and, but they're 30 minutes later, then we discuss the person who has control issues may not reflect as kindly on that that kind of thing. If my wife, yes, that's that's who I'm talking about, in case that wasn't uh, shielded well enough. If she does that, my usual response is, I'm sure she has a good reason. I mean, if she was at Trader Joe's and talked to Stephanie about some succulents, that's valuable time. You know, I hope hope she made an extra couple stops if it makes her weak less complex, if it helps her get things done. That's, that's usually my first response for a person like me if someone keeps me waiting that long. No, I get disproportionately mad and more so with those who are closest to me. That's not considerate. I don't have time to wait. I got things to do. Do you even care? So this disordered self of mine is just angry at a different level sometimes. And, you know, I say, but they're inconsiderate. But what I've done is I've made a good thing, being organized, having a plan, using your time well, that's a good thing. I've made it more important than the most important person in my life. Another idol of mine's baked within that, and this is, well, again, being transparent, it's, it's a good thing because I don't like when people are inconsiderate to others. You know, it may be, you know, if, if uh, you know, you're ever in a parking lot and you see someone get in their car and they see you but they get in their car and I don't know what they're doing in there for 10 minutes, right? You know, they get in the, I mean, and sometimes they even have the backup lights on and you're just like, and, and just, you know, usually my response is not, I'm sure there's a good reason, right? It's like, what a, I mean, I, I'm clean, but what a moron. I mean, that's what you're thinking. It's inconsiderate or, you know, when you're on a plane and the, the parent hands the iPad to the kids with no headphones. Again, you know, if that's you, that's not a big deal, please stop. But they... <laughs> It's just loud, and you get to listen to, you know, Daniel Tiger or Elmo or whatever that is. And, and, but that inconsideration, it's like, man, do they even know? They even know other people, you know, are here? You know, that's kind of how I think, and that's sin and everything. But again, please stop that. It would help us all. Um, but the reality is, my wife and I will be, like, at lunch or something, and, and, like, someone will start, like, a loud speakerphone conversation. And this isn't like a, hey, quick, are you coming? Cool. It's like, so what did your mom say then? You know, it's one of those kind of combos. And, and my wife sees me because I'm like, you know, I do that, do that kind of look. And, and if you know her, she's a peaceable woman. She's like, it's okay. No big deal. <laughs> she's just like, uh, you, you can eat your lunch and you can be okay. But, and again, we have these disorders. We have these idols. We have these things that may be good and they can have us jump to a different level. What are those idols that you see, that you have? Maybe your partner's not giving you the respect you deserve. I'm sure there's plenty of that here. Or I want affection. I need support. I need sexual intimacy or fulfillment. I want affirmation. They don't give me tenderness. I have this desire. I deserve these things. And again, most of those, if not all of them, are good things. But what happened is when they become the ultimate thing, you hate anyone or anything that keeps you from it. And nothing in you is supposed to be so important important to you that it produces malice, you know, bad thinking about someone else, wanting, you know, punishment for them or hatred or bitterness. Nothing should be more important than someone that you're close to. And in fact, if they are, they became an idol. Let me ask the question. What is it that you want bad enough that you're willing to yell at, tune out, abuse, or neglect those closest to you to get? You may have hit on what an idol is for you. Where are you bitter at your spouse? I mean, let's be truthful. The truth is, in some ways, they, in many ways, they're probably at fault. But it's at fault, and we react here, right? Because of how that affects what we want. So in summary, where do bitterness, anger, and malice come from? First, they come from the desires that have become idolatrous, desires that have become the ultimate thing. Second, taking upon myself the responsibility of vengeance. When you're wrong, there's something inside of you. There's something inside of me that craves justice. 
You know, there's a, there's a sense of justice. It's kind of, I heard someone say, it's like a divine tuning fork God put in us when something's unjust, especially when it involves you, you want to see it resolved. And that's why we like revenge movies, right? I mean, let's be, let's be really honest. Like revenge movies where someone did wrong, they paid for it. Uh, there's a movie called Man on Fire with Denzel Washington. And again, I'll, I'll say, don't send an email. I'm not making an endorsement. It is a, it's a big boy movie and it's not for everyone. It's definitely not for everyone. But in the movie, he plays a former CIA assassin. And so he did bad things in his career, has significant guilt, depression, he's messed up. And so he's an alcoholic, he's suicidal. He takes this job being a bodyguard uh, for a young girl uh, for, on behalf of her family in Mexico City. And so uh, in that relationship, she gives him hope again. And he, she gives him you know, a desire to live again, just being loved by others. And it's the grace of them. In, the, in, in that story, uh, she gets kidnapped and taken away. And he unleashes all that he's learned through the years on those who affect it. And this is not an endorsement of a movie or endorsement of, of, the, of the behavior and everything else. Uh, one of the people that he was going to kill, he was getting ready to kill him, and he was one of the ringleaders behind it, was tied up and he's just saying, hey, 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 uh, I, will you forgive me? I'm so sorry, will you forgive me? And, and uh, Denzel's character said, hey, it's not up for me to forgive. That's God's job. It's up to me to arrange the meeting. <laughs> and then he goes, hey, I'll give you whatever you wish. And again, I haven't seen it, but it's my favorite line. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, uh, he says, I'll give you every wish. And he goes, I wish, if you've seen the movie, you had more time. Amen. <laughs> and then, boom. And again, I'm not endorsing uh, vigilanteism, but there's something in us that craves justice. And I'm, not, I'm not, definitely not saying in your marriage you're thinking of those kinds of, uh, you know, taking it, taking it there. But it's very natural when you feel wrong to crave justice, especially in relationships. When you feel wronged, you want to see justice poured out. That's what makes this ne- next verse So important, what Paul writes in Romans 12. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. We live in an unjust world. We crave justice. We want to take it in our own hands. In our relationships, we want to take what's right into our own hands. But Paul says, justice be served. Every sin against me will be avenged in one or two places, you know, separation from God eternally or on the cross. You go back to the cross, he paid for it. He paid for what we deserved. We deserved. He releases us from all of this. He pulled the issue from the roots and he'll take care of it. You see, um, there was a Croatian refugee. His name was Miroslav Volf and his family was murdered in, um, in the ethnic cleansing that took place in Eastern Europe. And he was a Christian. He came to America and he was shocked to see uh, some people theologically who didn't, they weren't right, but he said, if you believe in a God of judgment and justice, that you will become a judgmental person. And he's like, the only people who would make a statement like that is someone who's not experienced injustice. When you've experienced it, when you've suffered that, the only way to escape the desire to take revenge is to know that God will bring it. He said that because he believed in a just God, he could let go himself. He knew that God would take care of it. It's not his response. It's not Miroslav's responsibility anymore. And, you know, when someone says forgive and forget, on one level we understand it. I think we all know it's impossible to forget, isn't it? Especially if it's a deep hurt. How do you forget what someone did to you? And on one level, while God erases basically our our sins, I believe that he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. There's no day or action he doesn't remember. At no point does he forget anything in the sense that he just can't remember it but he chooses not to remember it because Jesus paid for it. That's the promise he made for us. And because he did it, especially for us, there's no excuse for me and there's no excuse for you who are fully responsible for that sin he went to the cross to pay for. We've got to choose to be like that too. Forgiveness, no matter the relationship, it is a choice. It is a choice. And vengeance, justice, it's his. I can put away that. And we can, through him, rid ourselves of the bitterness, the malice, because he's got it. God's got it. 
Ephesians chapter four, we, we read this, but I'm gonna put it back on again. It says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. You see, when you hold the desire for justice taken into your own hands, do you know that you're giving an opportunity for the devil's power and influence to get a hold on you because you're trying to play the role of God. In fact, if you read the Bible, that's how he became Satan. I'm not saying you're going, yeah, hey, that's a different story, but harboring bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart is like looking at someone saying, you are a rat, and to punish you, I'm going to take rat poison. That's all it is. And some of you have that in you because someone hurt you. Maybe at some point in your life, someone, they left you. They broke promises. They not only disappointed you, but they broke your heart. And now you're left with bitterness. And the plea here from these, from these words God's given us is you need to bury that with Jesus because he took that on for you. And so our first command was to put away all bitterness and wrath, to get angry and not sin when we do, and pulling up the roots of, of malice, sorry, of, of vengeance. But let's go to command two for how to fight. In verse 32, Paul had written, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. The key is Christ forgave you. And this is all about positioning. Um, your faith is all about knowing that first and foremost, you're a sinner. Then of course, people sin against you. And if you recognize you're a sinner, and most of us do, and, uh, but it feels pretty far sometimes. You know, how profound is it that Mark Briggs deserves eternal separation from God? That's what I deserve. And so I should have recognition of my sin and gratefulness to God where I can forgive easier. You see, how much of people's grievances against you, what they've done to you, bother you, how much do they show you how little you're truly captured maybe by the gospel? And I would say this, for many of you, the one thing you need most, maybe today, is for the cross to become bigger. And let me say, I'm not, I'm not sweeping aside the painful wrongs. I mean, there's abuse at a level that none of us, some of us haven't experienced, some form of a neglect or betrayal or abuse. Those are deeper issues. And while the same principle applies, there's a lot more to work through. I am not sweeping that out of the rug. But we all need for the cross to be bigger. And what we're primarily addressing here is how in the everyday relationships we're in, we make good things, the ultimate things, and we allow our inability to receive them to get a foothold on our lives. And I would propose to you the reason you can't forgive is because the cross is too small in your life. Third command for how to fight. Paul had said in Ephesians 4, 29, 29 he said, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up, um, building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Let your words in your relationships be fill, filled with healing and grace, not hatred, not rep, retribution, not winning the argument. And in order to do this, you're gonna have to believe the core of the gospel is that grace changes people more than retribution. Think back, if you're a follower of Jesus, how did God change you? I, I know for, I mean, I know he didn't change you just for being obedient and you reaching some form of standard, works based off your own effort. He, he changed you through grace. And just for some of you, if you're newer to church and Christianity, every other religion, faith system in the face of the earth that's not Christianity is based on you earning your way to God. Everyone. It's all based on how well you do. The problem with that is you never know when you've done enough. The other problem is if I'm gonna make up a religion, that's a very human thing to go, of course you have to earn your way. You get what you deserve. I mean, that's a very human, humanly crafted way. The gospel is grace changes you. It's, he flips it upside down. And it's transforming. Only massive outpourings of grace can change our hearts. And we notice in verse 29, he says, according to their needs. You see, there's an art in knowing what to say in relationships and when to say it. And you want to know the number one factor in that art? Listening. You're not going to know what fits the occasion until you've listened well. In addition, treating others with grace, that doesn't mean you don't confront them. I, I hope no one hears that here at all. Or just constantly roll over on it. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is to confront somebody 
You care too much about the relationship to let it go. In my professional relationship, I've gotten, I probably, one of my, my skills, and I don't talk like this a lot, to take it in the spirit it is, one of the things I've developed is I can give tough news in a, probably the most digestible way. I, I've gotten used to giving bad news, you know, telling people they don't get what they want or talking to employees about that and all of that kind of stuff. But I've just gotten used to doing it because I, I can take the emotion out but keep the compassion in. But I say that because I can be just as ineffective when it comes to talking to my wife. I can flip it, the emotion in it, the sense of what's the justice, the sense of she did this and that. And again, we all have that. The selfishness of wanting to get what I want gets in the way. But you and I could choose. We can choose to build up or we can choose to tear them down. And so as we come to, in this last section, we're going to just focus on some very practical steps to help us build up our marriages. And uh, we're calling this the stages of grace-saturated, gospel-centered fighting. And this is true in whatever relationship you're in. And again, we've been focusing on marriage, but it's applicable to all. But we're just going to roll through those as, as we close up in the next few minutes. But number one, first stage in grace-saturated, gospel-centered fighting is examine your heart. I mean, that's the core. Even if you've been wronged, what does your anger say about your heart? You got to pause. And reflect on this. I'd, I'd ask you to even write them down, just so you know. Put them in your phone. I mean, maybe they're in the Bible app. But has malice, has bitterness, has anger, has it snuck in in an unhealthy way? Because these always indicate idolatry, which is a lot bigger problem in your heart than how your spouse treated you in the moment. I need you to ask this. Have I made, fill in the blank, respect my ultimate thing? Have I made communication? Have I made you know, sexual intimacy? Have I made these such an ultimate thing that I don't think straight? My, my anger is disproportionate to the offense. Can I not approach them the right way? But examine your heart, understanding that and focus how you see things. The second stage is overlook whatever you can. Again, we all need to hear this. We don't have to comment on every little infraction. You know, my, 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 Theory is that often we're, we're almost building a case. <laughs> you know, if there's some issues, it's like the other day I did the, and it was just, I'm not going to tell you real specifically, but it was like, what a boneheaded thing to say. That accomplished nothing. Because I brought up something I had said before, like, well, if we would just do it this way, because again, I'm Mr. I'm Mr. Organized. And she thought, oh, thank you for your wisdom. That's how what she said to me. No, it may not have gone quite that way, but um, overlook whatever you can. You don't have to respond. You can choose your battles. Proverbs 19.11, it says, a person's wisdom yields, pati yields patience. It is to one's glory, glory to overlook an offense. Proverbs 12.16, fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent can overlook an insult. And just for clarity, this does not apply to things that do lasting damage in a relationship. I mean, if you have to address the problem, that's why you have a that's why you're in a church. That's why you're in a small group. That's why you have pastors. That's why you have mentors. Hopefully, people speaking into your life. But um, any kind of abuse, you got to face that. You got to bring people along to help you. And for too long, the church and society could sweep those under the rug and overlook and just give grace when uh, it needs to be addressed. But there are times that you and I need to speak up to confront, and there are times to just let it go. And there's a real art to knowing the difference. But I think intuitively, God gives, his spirit gives us the ability to do that. Third stage is be practical in how you fight. <laughs> I like that one. Be practical how you fight. Um, Ephesians 4, 29, it was talking about don't let the unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs. I know a lot of you aren't going, okay, we're in this fight. What's best for them right now? I, I know that's not, I know that's probably not the natural for you, but you, what you say is only helpful for building others up is the perspective that you need to have. And it doesn't mean you don't address wrong, but your goal is to be constructive. Remember, we want someone to be more like Jesus. We want them to be holy. And again, we're gonna falter through this, but if the intention is what are their needs? Because if you win the argument and you can point out their, you know, their issue and not communicate it in an unhelpful way, you may win the battle, but you'll lose the war. And you're fighting the war together. You're not fighting against each other. And that's where we lose it. In Proverbs 12, 18, it says, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Watch our words. Be practical. Think about their needs. 
The fourth stage is be quick to listen and slow to speak. I'll say it again. Be quick to listen, be slow to speak. I come from a long line of men who have the solution, okay? And how often do we want to head into a conflict with the solution? Be quick to listen. Proverbs 18 says, he who gives the answer before he hears is a folly and a shame. And so some advice I heard recently on this is be a servant listener. Be a servant listener. Seek to understand and then be understood. Think of their thoughts through the lens of Philippians 2. Consider their thoughts and needs more important than your own. Isn't this the opposite of the way that we come into most of these discussions? Here's the key. When you're looking at your spouse, they are not your enemy. They are not your enemy. And it's so easy to think they are in the moment. Also, don't interrupt. Interrupting says your thoughts are more important than, or my thoughts are more important than your thoughts. Hear them. Ask questions. Really seek to understand them. And this is obvious. I think many of you would probably be great in some areas of your life, but when you get the emotion of a personal relationship, it becomes difficult. Another thing is, you know, don't give premature advice. Just listen. Seek it out with one another. The next step or the next uh, stage here is seek resolution and not victory. I really want to focus on this for a second. The goal is not to win the day. The goal is not right. And sometimes you're going to have to say in some conversations with your spouse, and this is internal, please, you're going to say, I'm right. And I could win this. And this doesn't progress us towards any resolution. And it may be you just have to pause and go, hey, honey, I'm about to get upset. Let me, pa- you know, let me pause on this and think through, I need to find a way to resolve this, not to win. My goal's their sanctification, not my own vindication. And once you let go of that idea that you have to win, you can focus on what helps them. Number six, believe in God's overriding purposes in your marriage. What a lot of people in here need is the power of hope. I I heard about an experiment, and a lot of these experiments have to do with rats, but it's relevant for us, you know, people who like to, I don't know, hurt animals when they're little or something. But um, there's a legendary experiment when a researcher was trying to determine how long it would take a rat to drown. Again, what'd you do today, honey? Well, uh, we were looking at some rats in the water. But if you just threw them in the water, what they found out is they would drown after 10 minutes. Again, hey, we know this now. (laughs) You're like, thanks, Mark. But if he took them out, the person doing the research, after six minutes and took them out, I'm not sure for how, but a little bit, and they put it back in for six minutes, took them out, and did it a third time, they found that some rats could swim for more than 60 hours. 10 minutes to 60 hours, changing no factor except the introduction of hope into the equation. And there's one factor that if we could introduce it into our marriages, and maybe what you need desperately this week, that you can introduce into your marriage that would do more to strengthen it than anything else, and that's hope. And hope comes from knowing that God has a plan for your marriage. He knew who you were going to marry. He knew their warts, their idols, He knew the consternation they would cause. He's got a plan to make something beautiful out of it, but he needs you to be invested in that too. The same thing's true if if you're not married. God has a purpose for you, even in the difficult relationships in your life. Number seven, speak grace-saturated words. If you're speaking words that build up and not tear down, you'll do as Pastor Chris said, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. He said, be an encouragement machine. You remember that? Be an encouragement machine. Don't focus on what's wrong or how they mess up. Instead, do your best to move towards a vision of where God's leading them. Try not to demean them uh, by obviously name calling, but it has to be said. Don't say you, you know, don't say you are this. Say you did this. Avoid saying never. You never do that. You always do that. Don't escalate it beyond the problem themselves. Avoid being sarcastic. Don't be condescending. And don't confront in front of other people. Again, we, a lot of us have failed there. Number eight, and this, it gets hard here, but remember, it's truly forgive. Remember, forgiveness in our relationships is a choice. It's a choice not to remember or bring up the offense any longer, just as Jesus did for us. And you have to think of past flaws as ammunition, ammunition they've already spent. Try not to get historical when you fight, but forgiveness should never be conditional on their repentance. And I know there's unique situations, 
that aren't easy. But reconciliation requires two parties. Forgiveness requires one, and that's you. It requires one. The only alternative to forgiveness is bitterness, which is like trying to punish them by the poison you take. And finally, do all things out of reverence for Christ. The only way for all of this to happen is for the cross to go grow large in your life. And that's why some of you may lack the ability with some of here because your cross is small. But Mark, you don't understand. You don't know what they did. You don't know how much that hurt. If you do things only as an act of service for your spouse, you're probably going to lose motivation. But if you do it as a service to Christ, it may win. Keep your eyes on the cross. And the cross is the motivation. It's the example. It's the purpose. It it helps us recall where we've come from. But lean on God in his spirit because this is where you get the courage to deal with the messy things, to work through the conflict. I was thinking about when there's a building burning down, you hear stories of those who run in to get those who are there. What motivates a rational human being to run into a burning building? It's love. Whether it's a public official who loves serving people and and that's their mission, or it's love for a child, a spouse, a family member. And I want you to think about this. We're never going to change any of the stuff we've talked about until our love for them exceeds our fear. You may have a burning building at home. And some of these things you go, well, I'll start doing that once they, again, you, you know the folly in that and you know where it leads. But what's the idol that you're hanging on to that you need to let go of? Can we live out a grace-saturated marriage? Join me on that journey as we take one step in front of the other. Let's pray. Lord, there's not a lot of easy things to do here. I I recognize that. May we be overwhelmed by your love and your cross and have a vision for those we love, Lord, to know you, to be who you've called them to be, and that as we are chasing after you, Our marriages may never be better. Our relationships may never be better. But Lord, let your spirit give us the humility to own our response, to invest in others who may not deserve it. Almost in most cases, definitely don't deserve it. But we didn't deserve it either, Lord. So we give this to you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Stand as we continue to worship. I believe in the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. I believe in the power of the gospel still makes the broken whole. And I believe that the curse of sin was broken and it rolled away that snow. I believe, I believe, I believe. And as I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. And no matter where I go, and no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. I believe that the walls will start falling when we fall down on I believe that the lame will go walking and the blind are gonna see. I believe that the gates of hell will tremble when the church begins to sing. I believe, I believe, I believe. As I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord. No matter where I go, no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. Sing it to the daughters, sing it to 
the sun to every generation. Look at what the Lord has done. See to the darkness that the light has come. We'll sing it to the nations. Look at what the Lord has done. Sing it to the daughter. Sing it to the sons. To every generation. Look at what the Lord has done. Sing it to the darkness. That the light has come. Sing it to the nation. Look at what the Lord I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. And no matter where I go, no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. As I bow before you, Lord, I will rise. God is good. Amen, church. Man, well, it's so good to worship together. As always, we have our prayer team up towards the front of the stage, and we all need prayer, and we would love to pray for you. So come on up, and on your way out, why don't you find someone new and encourage them, and we'll see you guys next time. Have a great week. God bless.